So, uh, we'll get you to lunch in a little bit. But uh, as uh, this is a reference that will, that will go right by most of you. As the narrator of the old Rocky and Bullwinkle cartoons used to say, now for something completely different. Um, we uh, uh, heard yesterday and today of, about a variety of platforms and programs um, that were fairly specific. Uh, programs that deal in various venues that are created to do specific things in specific places. We're going to take a rather 30,000 foot view of that and talk about something a little bit different. And that is um, the way one controls or corrals the idea of AI in a regulatory or in a standards based way. <coughs> Excuse me. Before we get to the panel members, uh, just allow me to say a word or two about how we conceive of AI, or at least how I conceive of ODR, rather. Um, it's kind of exciting to think about ODR platforms as cradle to grave products, and that's what we've been really hearing. You go in the front door, it gives you everything you need, and you come out the back end with a resolution. But uh, with, uh, with apologies to Valentin's comment yesterday about when we started looking at ODR for uh, labor management issues, back in the late 1990s, I was working on labor management issues in the U.S. using ODR. And that experience led me to have a particular notion of how to define ODR that's a little bit different. And my distinguished colleagues on the panel here can disagree with me if they wish. Um, but we tend to think, when we tend to talk about ODR, we tend to talk about it as a system in which the technology offers a comprehensive approach to the dispute resolution process, whatever that process might be, whether it's judicial or commercial or whatever. My experience as a mediator and as a facilitator and as someone who developed labor management issues is that uh, my definition of ODR and the one that we're going to operate with a little bit today is that if you are using technology to fulfill any of the basic functions that you have to fulfill as a third party, then what you're doing belongs to the ODR tent, whether it's a cradle to grave system or not. But if I'm using it to, to do some core function of my work, then I think that's an ODR enterprise. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, what we've also heard about over the last day, is, day this morning, is um, the move toward AI taking over more and more of the process of dispute resolution. We've been talking specifically mostly about judicial issues and some commercial. And eventually we're going to have, uh, as somebody said this morning, I think it was Jeremy said, I don't remember who it was, somebody was talking about having an AI mediator. Eventually we're gonna have that, but right now that's not what we got. Right now what we have uh, are more along the lines of what you were talking about, which is the AI doing certain specific things that will help you out as a third party, that, will, that are built into a, a system that you have thought about in terms of what the functions are you have to fulfill. Um, <clears throat> pardon me, and so the, the development of, of AI which we shouldn't have called AI in e-commerce, and Colin Rule has been referred to as the godfather of ODR uh, for what he did at, at eBay and PayPal. That's not new. What is new is the addition of a new player in ODR in, in um, AI. And you know, for, for the last few months, the reaction to the notion of the release of AI products has been a combination of of absolute fear <laughs> and, and people saying, gee whiz, that's really cool, I wonder what I can do with it. And so we've got on the one hand, there's fright, and on the other hand, there's elation. Um, one of the major issues that has come out in the discussion of AI has been how do you avoid harmful use and how do you build guardrails so that people who want to use AI responsibly know what to do. And the simple answer, the short answer to the first part of that is that we probably can't keep the bad guys from doing what they're going to do. If you engage in the development of AI and you make it an open system and you release it, then you lose control of what's going to happen. And if somebody wants to do something nefarious, they're probably going to do that. So when we talk about standards and we talk about regulation, what we're really talking about is if people want to behave ethically, what are the boundaries in which they should be behaving? <clears throat> Excuse me. So uh, what we're going to do today with the panel is take three approaches to that. Leah Wing, who's the director of the center that's hosting this, is going to talk a little bit about the relationship between existing standards of practice and, and ethics in dispute resolution and online dispute resolution and how they might fit into 
standards of practice for artificial intelligence developers and users. Then, uh, <coughs> pardon me, Chris Draper is going to use his long experience in regulation development to talk about a regulatory approach to guardrails for artificial intelligence. And then we're going to wind up with Scott Cooper, who's going to use his long experience in standards development to talk about what's different between regulation and standards and, <coughs> pardon me, um, and how we can combine the two. The guiding principle, which I think the three of us agree on, and my colleagues can feel free to disagree, um, is that taking one approach to building guardrails for AI is a losing proposition, that it's complicated. And uh, there's a, a book that's recently published by Mustafa Suleiman called The Coming Wave. I'll just read a, a quick quote that I think will set us up and I'll turn it over to, uh, to Leah. Think of containment as a set of interlocked and mutually reinforcing technical, cultural, legal, and political mechanisms for maintaining social control during a time of exponential change. And I think we are in a time of exponential change. So Leah, with that, I'll hand it over to you. Thank you, Daniel. I am thrilled to be on this panel. Um, and y'all not, uh, not moderating, I'm going to let loose. <laughs> Stand <So>. back. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I appreciate that you brought up the question of the definition of ODR. And um, I will I'll weigh in. But I, I guess I would say, most importantly to me, I think that that needs to be an overt ongoing discussion um, in the field as well as with stakeholders who are, don't consider themselves part of our field. Um, the center put out a document on framing the parameters of ODR. If you haven't seen that, consider going to the publications section of ODR.info. We have both a graphic that Chris beautifully developed as well as a kind of an overview that tries to map the discussion around that. And I think it makes uh, a huge impact when we're talking, in effect, about two different things. And some people are considering ODR, the cradle to grave, as you talked about. And some people are calling any, any section of your process that includes technology as um, ODR. And so I will say that the standards I'm going to speak about are related to the concept that Dan brought up, which is any time you're using technology. The question is, what guardrails or best practices are you considering? So I just want to say that as a backdrop to my contribution here. So I want to offer this continuum as a way in which I'm thinking about this at the present time. Technology is disrupting the way we handle disputes in ways that are incredibly powerful, exciting, useful, and also, as our keynote speaker mentioned, um, bringing the unknown into the present, right? Um, it is allowing for creativity and innovation, but it also has a tension with our concern about protection. Um, and as we think about who needs protection, what needs protection, we could be clinging on to status quo that really needs the disruption, or we could be clinging on to core values that really does need protection. So I think this, there, there, I imagine that this tension will continue to exist and it's important to acknowledge in the discussion around guardrails. So I'm just going to name here a few, this is certainly not comprehensive, some of the core values of justice systems and of ADR. Um, I put under empowerment both agency and choice because I think that having um, agency and no viable set of choices is not fully empowered. So I want to kind of name both components. Access to justice, efficiency in a variety of ways, and historically, a neutral third party. Again, there's cultural values placed on the emphasis around neutrality um, that is not shared across all cultures and all settings. Um, and then issues of fairness. And when we add tech, then I've made this all bigger to try to visually highlight the point that what I'm saying is it has the ability to really magnify this, to give us more choice, more agency, more options, more access to justice, greater efficiency without a doubt, 
and adding a fourth party, and whether that fourth party is a tool that assists us, or the fourth party is making decisions, or a fourth party is a venue, right? We have fourth parties that are now in the mix, and the ability for far more fairness. But we also have both proven uh, threats to these core values and the many others that I didn't list here, um, and also fear about that, as well as examples of success in ways that um, empowerment or access to justice have been, have uh, certainly been uh, achieved to a greater extent than before we included technology. But now with AI, again, I would say all of the concerns around when we add technology to our core values or, and, and our processes, um, the fear, the concern, and the evidence so far already shows that we do have real threats. So a conversation around protection, around um, uh, protecting processes, protecting people, and protecting our core values is important. October 6th, last week, AI was asked to create images of black African doctors treating white kids. Is that an AI function that you'd like to include in your process if you are an arbitrator, a judge, a facilitator, a mediator, deciding a bail hearing, giving you a prompt as a disputant, making a decision? After more than half a century exploring AI, why is this still happening? Who's at the table making the decisions? What's the lens being used? And I, there are many examples out there. I think that placing a racialized example is important, but there are many other examples where we're seeing bias. This is not new to the conversation, but I want to bring it into the room right now when we're talking about guardrails. So when we add a AI, I think we probably have quite a lot of evidence already to show that it can dramatically increase efficiency in our processes and access to justice and empowerment through agency and, and, and more choices. Um, but it also has already proven that it's reduced access to justice and not equally across all identity groups, consumer groups, or disputants and frankly, even third-party interveners. Um, and I was thinking about a comment that Jeremy made, uh, I, I believe, yesterday about trust. And I think, if I will hopefully not take you out of context, trust for courts, trust for public processes, and I think we want to consider this about trust for private processes as well when we think about guardrails. So, um, just the other day, I got a call from my cable provider that said, you're up for a new upgrade on your cable box and we'll send someone out to deliver it and plug it in for you, great. When it arrived, I got a new remote. And um, while I'm frustrated because I don't know how they figure that they should put the volume section like totally far away from where your fingers are. Anyway, what I did find that theoretically is useful is it now offers the ability for me to click and there's a microphone and I can do voice commands. So it's just offered me more choice. I can now use my fingers or my voice. If I was someone who had very bad arthritis or had some other impediment to my using my fingers, it would actually provide me more access. Um, it also raised concerns for me about whether I was already being listened to. And if I wasn't and I pressed it, and then my voice was included. Is my voice being recorded? Because my voice is kind of like a fingerprint. So who's getting access to that? And once I tried it once, was it automatically going to start listening? How do I turn it off? Trust. Transparency about how AI is being used are questions that are urgent in every aspect of our life, right? So the National Center for Technology and Dispute Resolution created a set of standards in 09 um, that uh, have been used, uh, thank you Frank, have been used by um, ICANN 
for um, more than a decade now. And in 17 and in 2022, we've updated them, collaborating with the International Council for Online Dispute Resolution. And you can find copies at both these websites. Um, and you could see, okay, these are some additional values that are uh, held um, in, in, the, in the field of um, ADR and of courts, uh, certainly, um, that are of relevance when we, when we add technology. Um, I'm not gonna go into all of them. I'm gonna sh show you the list, but I'm not gonna go into depth on all of them. I wanna highlight some things around AI before I close. Um, but I will say that each one of them specifically focuses on um, when you're using technology in some part of your uh, dispute resolution process. And we tried to make them thin enough that they could be interpreted in ways that would be relevant in different sectors of society or in different cultures or different legal jurisdictions. We're happy to say that they are catching on and we hope that we'll have an announcement soon that um, the majority of countries around the world have found a way to support them. We're in the midst of some engagement around that. Um, so it's exciting to see that they have relevance. I also think it's important that we view them as a living document because while they start to be interpreted, we're gonna find where there's things that are missing and while technology changes rapidly, more rapidly than our standards, we'll need to catch up. So as, as promised, let me just highlight a couple things about AI. Accountability for, for this, is, this is the floor, right? This is not the ceiling, this is not best practice, this is not guidance, this is the musts, right? <laughs> So for an ODR process or platform to be accountable, this must include human oversight of traceability of the originality of documents and of the path to outcome when artificial intelligence is employed. And the determination of the relative control given to humans and artificial decision-making strategies. If we go back to the value of empowerment, right, and choice, it, it's stating that it's important for people to know when they are the decision maker and when AI is. ODR system design must include proactive efforts to prevent any artificial intelligence decision making function from creating, replicating, or compounding bias in process and outcome. Human oversight is required in ODR system design and auditing to identify bias, make findings transparent to ODR providers and users, and eliminate bias in ODR processes and outcomes. So there's kind of an acknowledgement this is a journey. As we're using large language um, models, we're using big data, we're experimenting, we're doing our best to create systems that will work, um, bias is going to appear. So we need to attempt to proactively prevent it and also to identify it when it's there. This, of course, the, the, these, we, we frame these uh, standards as, as interlocking, as related, not that we're cherry picking them. And so there are ways in which things I've already mentioned relate to transparency, but here's something specifically regarding being transparent. ODR that uses AI must publicly affirm compliance with jurisdictionally relevant legislation, regulations, or in their absence, guidelines on transparency and fairness in AI systems. And there are other sections of each of the standards that could be interpreted regarding AI. For example, the next line, ODR must clearly disclose the role and magnitude of technology's influence on restricting or generating options and in final decisions or outcomes. So I'm thinking back to the last comment Dan made in the previous session before our break about how um, we can replicate one culture's set of values or ways of doing dispute resolution through AI and then hand it out as if it's neutral and culture free, right? And so as we think in advance, again, about who's at the table doing the decision making about this and what options are being developed, but also making transparent to the users who include third parties, but also the disputants, um, where actually AI is limiting options. We're saying we've done our best to package 
What would be best given all the items that you're arguing over and all the parties involved? Here are five options. Well, actually, that could be incredibly useful and save tremendous time. We privileged efficiency. But actually, AI has decided what's valuable and what's not, and it has missed things because of, let's say, um, how the messages about how it's supposed to be utilized has been embedded. So I would like to ask us to think what additional standards will be needed as AI increasingly runs the show, including the possibility that people will decide that either the standard needs to eliminate the fact that humans need to be in the loop or to not follow these standards and instead decide that we don't need humans in the loop. So I hope with that, that we can have a good continued discussion. We welcome at any time, because this is a living document, that you're in touch with other ideas about how the standards can be strengthened. Thank you. Chris? So, um, just to start by confronting sort of my bias and how I look at this. My uh, career started in the uh, development and enforcement of regulations for the commercial space industry, um, which has then moved into, from my PhD, the actual modeling behind those, uh, behind those standards. And since then, I've moved into the dispute resolution space, primarily looking at um, how do we control uh, the, the, the means of ensuring fair uh, inclusion of all parties, uh, the identification, the seeking of understanding, and the building upon those agreements. So that's how I look at these problems and look at the tools um, when we're looking at from what could be useful from a regulatory standpoint. Um, one of the things I think is uh, important is I do believe in smart performance-based regulations as a catalyst for safe innovation. I think often our discussion gets around this issue of efficiency as with this idea that efficiency is always better. Um, efficient injustice is still injustice and is often worse. So I'm not entirely sure I want to be accelerating a bad system. So with that, the question is now, what is a bad system and who gets to choose, which is a lot of the areas that I think we all agree on. Well, I haven't heard Scott speak on it yet, so we won't promise him. However, I know the rest of us believe in, right? which is what, what are the standards of identifying what is an effective justice system, the technologies now actually let us even think through what, what is even justice, right? Um, I, I think I, I put a piece on ODR.info. We, you know, we, we, in a lot of ways, probably need to even start to re-look at how we frame the outcome. We've always looked. There's many lawyers in the room. I, I believe I'm not a lawyer, although I just dress like one. So the issue is that um, justice, while it was often seen as procedural, and AI can help us very effectively in making procedures more efficient does not mean we arrive at justice. We could start getting into things with AI like we can start optimizing for the minimization of negative access to outcomes after that as being a new definition of justice. We can do all these things now as long as we don't let the regulations or the standards that they're often going to be based upon get in the way, right? So from that, though, hopefully the discussion we get here is, you know, what is the core strategy that if we are going to be the builders, influencers, and uh, in a lot of cases, the, the, sort of the driving users of these systems, what are those core strategies we should think about, and what are our parallels within other types of high technology dangerous systems? How should we be looking at how other people have approached this, right? For example, the rocket industry. The rocket industry is basically a big insurance play. Basically, if you follow in the United States, uh, Canada is very similar, although we, we have an indemnification boundary. If you follow all of the rules that the FAA puts out, unless you're Elon Musk, because apparently he gets to do whatever he wants. But if you follow all the rules that the government puts out, what you're actually getting is access to $1.5 billion of indemnification beyond your insurance policy if something goes wrong. So if you follow all the rules, they say, oh, we'll back you to $1.5 billion. Canada has no limit, and most of the countries don't have a limit, but that same strategy of what's my carrot, and in that case, it's an insurance carrot fundamentally, right? Um, when we look at, uh, you know, the, down to the other range, you know, lawnmowers. Lawnmowers is a fundamentally dangerous system. We require decks, right? That's something we finally got to understand the system well enough. We said, yeah, we should probably just not have a big whirling blade slowing around your feet, right? We should probably require that to be there because we all agree this is dangerous. AI is harder to see those dangers. 
I think we can even agree in this room of individuals who are all informed individuals on this topic, especially given the morning presentations, that we all have varying ranges of whether or not I'm looking at an undecked lawnmower. I argue we are. Um, Tesla, right? Tesla has a new uh, convertible mode. I don't know if you guys saw it the other day. It's where you actually set the car to 72, you let it drive under a truck, take out the top of the car and the person, and it keeps driving. It's a really crazy new mode. <laughs> and now we're gonna actually be going to court as to whether or not they're liable for it. And the question is, do we actually need to wait to adjudicate these things in a court upon death? Should we allow AI to remain a blood industry, like the rock industry always was, or should we get a little smarter about it? Now, as we start to look at the other strategies to get smarter about it, for example, um, in Iowa with cybersecurity, uh, cybersecurity and um, you know, AI have a lot of parallels in a state like Iowa. Iowa has 0.1 million less working age adults than Chicago. So the city of Chicago is bigger than our whole state, fundamentally. Our businesses are going to have $45 billion of wealth transfer within the next 10 years. 85% of them are not prepared for that transfer. They're trying to do more with less, and they're going to be primarily massive users of these off-the-shelf AI systems, and in the process, giving away almost all of their intellectual property in very thin, high-asset businesses away to whoever took it. We talk about AI and its damages in the retail space, but I look at my access to be economically independent in a state like ours, where right now, if my skill set is the actual identification, delivery, and efficiency of some of these you know, farm equipment, commodities, these spaces where my margins are very, very thin, it's very service-based, right? If I'm giving away all of my intellectual property because I said, you know what, I think I want to actually build my business plan with ChatGPT, and like, why, why can't I just let you know, Microsoft own it? We aren't thinking about those long-term impact pieces, which is why when we start looking at cybersecurity, a cybersecurity bill passed in Iowa the other year, and I was actually really, really proud of actually working on it. You, you should read it. We were very thoughtful right? because we went through and we started off by saying, oh, here's all the actual government stuff that the insurance industry and everything else does. But our market is those mid-sized businesses between 50 to 80 people, which is 90% of our country, right? That's who's actually in danger. And so what we did instead was we actually put in uh, maximum probable loss as a limit on the actual cost of an actual cybersecurity program. If you run a cybersecurity program, what you get is an, uh, you get an affirmative defense against any claim that you didn't have one, that you were being, that you were being uh, unreasonable and you were being, apologies for not being a lawyer and I'm blanking on the right word, someone else shout it out, sorry if you know it. Never mind, okay, I'll, we'll look it up. However. So basically, you have access to an affirmative defense if you follow the rules that are within that legislation, right? Or that, that legislation. Uh, the year before, uh, we did a uh, piece on smart contracts. Uh, and again, in, in that one, uh, the, the item in there was an, aff an affirmation that your contract cannot be identified as not a contract as long as it both had the actions of a contract and also had the features of how we defined uh, smart contracts. In the state of Iowa, we actually bring back the 1996 strategy of a smart contract. We do not require crypto in it, right? And we look at, uh, we do not require crypto in it. When you look at um, uh, blockchain, we also do not require mining in it, right? Which is very different than places like Wyoming, which gets the most, uh, the most views and credit, which is a, ironically, an oil, uh, coal company driven uh, effort, right? Um, we're right now looking at a AI piece of legislation in Iowa that I'm, I'm hoping gets put forward, we'll see. I think we have a very good sponsor for it, but the objective there is in a lot of ways to start saying, let's look at number one, ensuring ownership, accountability, and transparent, auditability and transparency. The features of that one, very similar to the principles of ODR, number one, ownership. If you're using any model, let's make sure that you're actually identifying who owns the data. We don't, you know, the, the American data play that we've always had is, oh, okay, here's this whole data, I just changed the title, now it's mine, right? That's how we've always done it. So the question is, if it comes in, whose is it, right? Second one, auditability, as Bob identified and many others here today, you, know, you cannot see the guts of these probabilistic models in a way that we can actually understand them. I must know their being by their function. And so we must actually have access, if you're impacted by these tools, by the actual outcome that they provide, right? Last piece being transparency. I go to the store and I pick up a can and if I looked at the back of the can and says, we can't tell you this is proprietary, you'd be like, oh, I don't know if I want to eat that. 
Well, this one in transparency says we need to actually make, if you're an, you're, if, if you're an impacted individual, we need to ensure that you have access to identify what's actually in your tool, right? If you have a tool that, depending on your political leaning, if your tool has a 99% Breitbart input, uh, you probably might not want it, just like someone else might not want a 99% MSNBC input into it, right? You do want to be able to know in some sense what it is because as identified by a professor earlier, the challenge is that none of these models are all being developed in isolation. They're being developed off of chunks of other pieces. When we look at the AI models we're using in our company, the AI models we're using are built off a lot of open source. That open source already has packaged, uh, packaged biases into it that I don't know what they are. I'm not sure what's in the package. And now how do you actually hold someone downstream liable for an accident that actually came from some dude on Substack in his, you know, in his underwear in his college dorm? <laughs> what do you do with that, right? Because there's some, there's some good stuff from those people, right? So the question is, wh where, where do you do that? So this type of legislation looking at, hey, these are the principles we want. How do we get, it, how do we get a foothold that we can build from because we don't know where it's going to go? The last piece of the Iowa item, which we're discussing actually after lunch break, um, but is, is incredibly important is going to be, again, which we haven't talked about much when they get into the legislative front, which is different than the, which is different than the standards piece. The legislation provides, legislation and regulation provides you access to implement what should have been well-developed standards, but they let you implement it as a function of the relevant jurisdiction. With these tools, are our jurisdictional concepts appropriate anymore? We think about data often from a, da from a, from a digital, digital sovereignty perspective. In America, ownership of data is a function of its physical manifestation. We don't have a natural right to our data in our country, right? It's my physical manifestation of it on the silicon that actually matters and turns it into a property. Well, we're always worried about where the property lives, right? We don't, want, we don't want the property living in some place that doesn't like us or anything else like that because we're worried about the system's operation. AI, if I'm using it, is a big probabilistic model. And the fact is it's going to be replicated in a whole bunch of different places. And I don't really care if it's sitting in, you know, I, I personally don't care if the model is sitting in Iran or whether it's sitting in Florida, whether if it's actually the same model. What I care about is what is the source of the information that created the data from which I'm now extracting replications of that information. That's a very different concept, which actually uh, Nikki Gillibrand is uh, talking on later today, which is we need to be looking at do we shift to an informational sovereignty concept? Because when I'm looking at what these tools are, especially in the ways that we're using them, is that the model, if you're going to use it within an ODR space, must be regulated based on a jurisdiction where I can ensure the inputs, the information that created the data that I'm now replicating to become my recommendations, is reflecting lawyers from my community. But are any of our tools doing that, right? And in Iowa, we take the first step, hopefully, to actually identifying that the legislation we're looking at is going to be actually appropriate for those who are either um, using or contributing to a model who are citizens of Iowa. Right? So it's their data that we identify ownership with that's going to be there. Now, if this goes through, it's going to be fundamentally transformative. We'll see if anyone actually you know, thinks about this too much before we go, but that's the point of this panel here today, right? is how big do we need to make the shifts, and in some of those shifts, how much will we recognize them? Right? Sorry, last example, how do you attack other items like you know, social media? Right? I mean, you know, legislation-wise, we're not being successful. Is AI going to be similar? Should we be attacking social media like cigarettes? In my opinion, yes. We have, you know, we, we attack cigarettes as an addiction. We now, and we, we said, oh man, if I go and actually increase 10% nicotine, I might get 50% more sales. Social media, with, you know, social media is now able to say, boy, if I make this tweak, I've got 96.3% addiction improvement. It's an intentionally addictive tool that the AI system is now going to help accelerate. These are the types of issues predicated mostly on, again, is a preview to layer, jurisdictional issues, I think, are the core of it that get us to what legislation can we pass to develop the regulations that are appropriate upon which standards are most necessary. So is it fair to say that a regulatory approach, say the one in Iowa or anywhere else, 
is based on telling you what you shouldn't do or what you can't do? Um, I mean, does it give you no. a boundary? Yeah, not yet. So no. when we're looking at the way we're approaching the AI piece, we actually because there's n there, there we would never have an agreement on what um, what a penalty should even be, right? Or what I, the I'm harm actually is. asking about, about oh, sorry. Re regulation in general. Is that what regulations do? If I, if I pass a reg or a law, am I setting a boundary that says if you go beyond this, then you then you're you're violating the rule, as opposed to saying what you should do? Oh yeah. Yeah, I mean, I guess conceptually, I, I, I agree with you, right? A regulation is going to say, hey, I can't go here. But the question is, what is the stick when I, when I breach it, right? The stick, if I breach it, doesn't always have to be jail, right? The stick when you breach it, in the case of cybersecurity, the cybersecurity law in Iowa is, I no longer have access to that affirmative defense. What is the value of that? I'm not really entirely sure, right? I mean, but, but yeah, so I guess it depends on how you define the stick, but right. so... I agree and jurisdictionally, it may change from place to place. Oh, yeah. Which is the segue into Scott's comments about standards, which are not jurisdictionally bound. Yeah, well, Frank, sorry. I'm just wondering how you can reconcile those comments about regulations in the United States. Well, you know, I, the President of the United States can okay. create a standard. Okay, so stop right there. We're trying to look for <laughs> consistency. But anyway, go ahead. Yeah, like, And now the weather. <laughs> uh, you know, and, and so you've, you've had your house of legislature attacked by people w fully knowing that it's wrong. How, how are you then going to control an environment that lives in the ether with regulation? How much enforcement are you going to need for that? What's the cost going to be for that? That's kind of our point. Yeah. Oh, I go on. Well, I'm not making it for you. Yeah, it just it just seems like a contradiction to say, well, here's something that you know we can make better by regulation, but when you come from a culture where regulation doesn't seem to matter a whole lot, um, then what's the point of creating more regulation? Again, that's kind of our point. Okay. Yeah. I'm glad I helped. <laughs> go for it. <laughs> and. Well, well so I said, just remember what I said to start out. Um, when you create a system like an AI system and you release it, you lose control. <laughs> so it's going to go wherever it's going to go. Yeah. And the bad actors are going to do what they're going to do. And Leia can lay out as many best guidelines and standards and best practices as she wants. But if I'm a bad actor, I don't have to follow those at all. But then why have AI if you know that's going to be a problem? Well, that's you a know great that question. You know, well, we, we have, we have <laughs> you know, years of bots trying to break in and steal people's bank accounts and, you, you know, do, you know, the, all the things that those have done. If you have AI backing that up, um, then, you know, is, I, I mean, to me, AI is, is sort of the, 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 the perfect tool for international espionage. Want to use something other than just an observing thing like a bot to get in and look at stuff. But if you want to get in and get a bot and then create something within the uh, data that's used by people that make decisions about the security of a country or the world or a banking system or a small corporation or a small state in the United States, like, it's like creating something that you know is going to be bad. Like if, if, if Christopher Columbus knew that when he brought back tobacco leaves to Europe that millions of people would die every year from cancer, would he have thought it a good idea to take tobacco leaves back? Well, I think a better example is the steam engine that was used in the opening uh, speech today. Uh, we create the steam engine, we create the industrial revolution, it creates wealth, it does all sorts of great stuff. But it also makes it inevitable that we're going to have the climate problem that we have now. Uh, the, yeah. fact that, the fact that you create something and it has a dark side, which AI does, 
doesn't mean you shouldn't create it. It means how do you handle it? Yeah. The, the question is how do you handle well, it? Well, I think you got to worry about that afterwards first. Yeah. Well, can uh, I, I, we're stealing Scott's yeah. time, so we should have him go. Well, can I get one, one positive response back to Frank, though, of an example that does work? The biofuels industry, right? Biofuels industry has always been for 30 years rife with theft and fraud, and now the legislation is ratcheting down in a smart, the regulation is ratcheting down in a smart way. That industry is actually seeing uh, positive, fair, and more transparent growth. Is it good? No, it's not. I mean, we still have some, cha we still have some major challenges, but it is finally the, the regulation has been, um, and will probably be unique in actually thinking the APA has done well here within this industry. However, the, it has pushed the industry where it's gone with smart, thoughtful, and continuing to be iteratively improved. So I don't disagree that espionage tools like TikTok should probably be concerning. But at the same time, you know, there, there are examples where regulation have done smartly for a technology where we ensure innovation while, while we're worrying about safety can actually work. And in conclusion, Mr. Speaker, <laughs> uh, I'd like to uh, do a shout out to the keynote first. So he raised two issues that I thought were really important. Well, it was a good speech, but it was kind of an overview that probably most people were sort of nodding along saying, yeah, that sounds about right. I'm glad that he mentioned open source, that the trend was that's what we're seeing. I hope that continues and, and flourishes. His other point was that evaluation is challenging. Now, challenging is, is an incomplete in high school, and we are clearly challenged by how we're going to be handling evaluation of AI. And the problem is, is that govern, governments uh, almost are, are, are certainly going to overwrite new laws about new technologies. We don't know, or certainly we're all perplexed at this point about how it's all going to go forward, but definitely they don't know about it in D.C. or I suspect in most of the state capitals as well. I think that there's a real lack of, of knowledge about issues that we are, we're all going to confront, but they're, they're just trying to run to the head of the parade. And I, I think that that's going to be, uh, be a problem. Uh, the nation states are very good at creating uh, AI position papers. They're usually out of date after a couple months, but less successful in crafting and passing and implementing practicable policies. And, and this is true just across the board, but it's certainly true with any kind of new technology that uh, is, is trendy. I mean, we, we've seen this, you know, from the internet on, well, we've seen it, you know, from, from the, um, uh, the railroads on, you know, that, that when something new comes in, that, that's where, you know, the, the corporate mavens will, you know, will flock. Um, so we're gonna have a problem, I think, um, getting the nation states to buy into whatever solution we do come up with. The, the problem also is that the, the tech multinationals uh, who, who are very happy to share their concerns and, and commitments to trustworthiness, um, but their day jobs are still creating A1, you know, AI products in, in, in the back office. And they all do it, and, and we know it, and they know it, and they know that we know it, but that's just the way it's, it's, it's playing out. And so we are already, all of us are behind the parade. We're, we're not gonna get ahead of it. The question is, what do we do to sort of mitigate the, the, the worst and use the advantages that are out there uh, with AI um, uh, to, the, to the best possible degrees. Other groups need to be part of the discussion. The International Organization of Standards, ISO, has created a multitude of standards dedicated to trustworthiness of testing, inspection, and audits. And I think that's a very good place to start. You know, we can pass all the laws and, and they're gonna be very vague around the edges. And then we'll just watch the market just move forward. And if they have to, they'll pay the fines, you know, and, and move on. We need to get a different way to, to basically get um, get, get this market under control. And Standards has done that. It's done that uh, in the global marketplace. Um, it, it's uh, doing it with things like uh, uh, anti-corruption. Uh, we just did one uh, not so long ago on uh, worker safety in the global supply chain. I mean, there's a lot of things out there, but this is behind the scenes. You, you, don't, you don't really hear about it. What it does do, though, it, it shows that ISO and standards organizations uh, have the authority or gravitas to act as a global convening power. Not everybody can do that. You know, if the Chamber of Commerce wants to call a meeting, they can, but, but who's gonna show up? If, you know, if, if the standards bodies hold a meeting, I, I won't, you know, toot the horn, but it, it's, it's usually gonna be recognized as that's, that's a body, you at least have to show up to keep bad things, in your mind, you know, from happening. And, and AI is likely to be life-changing, there's no question about it. But we already have challenging problems with climate change, pandemics, poverty, and wars. You know, 
that are need in, in, in need of changing solutions. We all need the intelligence that we can muster up. Draconian laws that limit or outlaw expressive, provocative, or untested concepts should be treated cautiously. Um, there, there's, there's, there's places for all parties to meet, I think. That's the whole idea of the consensus process, and, and certainly in, in, in this industry as well. Uh, but but it has to, somebody has got to call that meeting to order, and somebody has got to show up. And so I, I hope that that includes uh, uh, our, our folks as well. Artificial intelligence, if used intelligently, can extend the power of the human mind, truly stealing fire from the gods. Not replacing human intelligence with computer-generated gener artificial intelligence, but in coupling the computer's power of creation with the ability of the human mind to develop synapses that form ideas and concepts. Vannevar Bush, who ran science policy during World War II, wrote in July 1945, <clears throat> uh, to consider a future device for individual use, which is a sort of a mechanized private file that can be consulted with exceeding speed and flexible, flexibility. Gee, what does that sound like? Um, but then Bush uh, goes on to give us wings to issues that are, are now before us with AI. It is an enlarged, intimate supplement to the memory. Now, interesting choice of words, not artificial, but intimate. Uh, part of the intimate contemplations and observations that populate our memory. Joseph Licklider, who was an early computer pioneer, wrote in 1960, the hope is not that, so in, that in so many years, human brains and computing machines will be coupled together very tightly and the resulting partnership will think as no human brain has ever thought and process data in ways not approached by information handling machines we know now. Then Vince Cerf looked at uh, uh, the whole issue of, uh, in the standards wars in the 1980s uh, to see where the new internet technologies were gonna go. And in his mind, it is expected that we will uncover important social, economic, and political issues. Over the long run, our objective is to seek, seek resolution for those issues. So that this idea that there's already this understanding, almost intuitive, among people who are developing the world we live in, that there was more than just the latest technology, and I include AI in that as well. It's the fact that we're moving in a direction, you know, fits and starts, you know, uh, for sure, but we're moving in a direction that is, is a forcing mechanism for our own knowledge base. We are forced to think more, we are forced to, to, to know more, uh, you know, there, there's so much of our, our brain we don't use. Well, I think now AI is going is to be the forcing mechanism to, to make that happen. Uh, last example, at the birth of the world, World Wide Web, Web in the 1990s, Tim Berners-Lee realized that the human remit was not just about creating revolutionary technologies such as the web. Behind such exciting technology, technological breakthroughs was a realization that computers could also follow and analyze the tentative connective relations, unveiling entirely new ways to see our world. A system like that would be a fantastic thing. Cool, cool man. Um, this is the vision, and, and I have, I have a, um, a, a, a strong belief that this is, this is a good one. This is something that I think we should believe in. But implementation is always the challenge. You know, it's, it's a cruel mistress. Um, and there's certainly formidable pushback uh, for those concerned about AI intelligent, uh, technology to be used in malign ways. The Future of Life Institute in March 20 of this year uh, sent a broadside saying, uh, should we develop non-human minds that might eventually out, outnumber, outspark, obsolete, and replace us? Uh, I think after due, due considerations, uh, most would, would say no, that, that that is not the future that we're looking for. But I don't think that's the right question. I don't think that's what we're facing. But we know the world is going to be different. We know that we have to prepare ourselves. And we're given you know, a certain amount of lead time in this. This isn't Pearl Harbor. You know, we have the ability to start planning on how we're going to use the tools we already have and tools we know that we're going to have to make up uh, in, in, you know, in practicable ways. And there will be regulations. There will be things coming out of the nation states and the states and the communities. You know. um, but there's also going to be, I think, behind that, the standards that kind of describe two things. One, the testing, inspection, and auditing, you know, sort of the back office work that's gonna to have to be done with AI to make sure that we have uh, an ability to know exactly, or as close as exact as we can get, what, what, what the, the provenance of, of, the, of that AI is. And you have, you have something called discovery in the United States, you know, where you can go back and you can look for the papers. You know, if you, if you have a, a paper you wrote in high school you better be able to show your, your, your notes you know, to, your, to your English teacher. It's that sort of thing 
that you, you're able to do in date stamping and indelible ink, and there's lots of things you can do with AI that's gonna be able to get that back under control, or at least give us a fair chance to stay in, in line with, with the malfeasance that is certainly gonna show up. Um, disruptive technologies have always raised concerns. Uh, Galileo's discovery of the moons of Jupiter, though uh, through the use of an adjustable machine, the telescope, in one motion made old theories of time and distance in the universe obsolete. Uh, this creating great angst among popes, ecclesiastics, and supporters of a stable, unmoving uh, Earth. The telescope first expanded our view of, of the universe by about 30 times. The Hubble and the Webb have, have, have reached magnitude, magnitudes of many, many more than that. And, and that's, that's a knowledge base that we're still, you know, taking advantage of. You know, the, the telescope knows more about, about the universe than we do. And it can teach us a lot. And, and that is, is, is the direction that I think that AI, you know, in, in, it's, it's in, in the benign form that we're looking for, is, is hopefully going to move to. Um, where was I? It's going after Galileo. Another adjustable machine, the printing press, made the written word available not just to the, the great and the good, but according to Erasmus, print would, be, would build a library that has no other limits than the world itself. Okay, that, that's the number of, of you know, axioms out there. But th that's the direction that, that, that people who think about you know, what's over the next horizon and, or what, what, where are we headed, at least the, one, the successful ones, have been thinking about these issues uh, you know, for centuries, if not millennia that maybe it's just, just built into our DNA, that this is what we're always looking for. We, we have so much of our brain we don't use, and AI is certainly gonna force us. It's gonna be a forcing mechanism to use it better than we do now. How much time do I have left? I, I can go a little bit longer. Uh, just a little bit. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll skip, skip the, uh, the telegraph then. <laughs> I'll save you in that. Uh, the internet has also been a disturbing technology. While the early internet appeared to be self-contained, Dragons were found lurking just a click away. Gated communities promised trustworthy experiences around the firewalls of AOL, CompuServe, and Amazon. Like medieval merchants, consumers would scurry between one trusted site to another, fearful, fearful of a false click. So there really are, in, in my mind, at least three issues uh, that, that are already on the table, I think, with AI, uh, and a couple others that, that should be. Um, clearly, dis uh, fiction posing is fact. Uh, a single document uh, is a lot easier to, to accept uh, tentatively as, as, as bona fides. But if you have to follow the provenance of that, of that document back, you suddenly, you're down an AI water um, rabbit hole because every other document, every truthful document is not gonna reflect what that AI document does. So there, 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 there are issues already there that, that we, can, we can call upon, a lot of it is common sense, to help solve. Uh, security, privacy, and PPP, PPI, uh, protected per personal information. Uh, these issues have been around for decades. Uh, there will be a transit, certainly, to AI, but the, the issues <coughs> uh, of deception uh, and uh, patterns of abuse have been, will, will travel, will transit from, you know, from, from new, uh, new industry to new industry. We're just gonna have to be smarter when we, when we realize that just around the corner is gonna be AI. We're not there yet, but we will be. And so we need the best thoughts of everybody in this room, everybody in the state capitals, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But also, you know, academics, um, uh, small businesses, um, standards groups. I mean, the, 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 I mean we, could, we could come up with a non-exhausted list of, of those people that should be in the room. Because it, it is something where we all are, are participating. We all have, a, have an issue that we have to, have to resolve. So anyway, in, in conclusion, Mr. Speaker, um, <clears throat> There are, there are a number of standards out there based around the ISO 9000 for uh, quality management that have created a template for global management standards. And that includes, as I mentioned before, ISO 14000 on environmental management, uh, ISO 45000 on, on global supply chains, and 3700 anti-corruption. These are all things that were done outside of the ambit of the nation states. The, these are not rules, they're regulations. They depend upon the, up, the acceptance and uptake in, in the marketplace by people you know, who use them. Um, and, and, and these are standards that, that have proved themselves in, in that marketplace. Um, I could go through a lot more standards. But, but the whole idea is, is that 
We're going to have regulation. I, I have no doubt about that. But I, I, I really fear that it's going to come at us from from odd angles. Uh, it's going to be uh, front run for all the wrong reasons. And I just hope we can we can sort of duck and cover and get through that and get to the other side and come up with a way to get everybody else who should be at the table involved. And, and um, I know the standards people um, do this for a living. I know that it's been a, a lot of your people here know the know these these uh, our, our our colleagues pretty well. Um, they're not my colleagues. They're they're, they're my, my my buddies. Um, but they all need to be at the table. And so I'll leave there and hopefully we can get some questions. Thanks. So before we open it up for questions from everybody else, uh, Leah, you heard the, uh, the framing of regulation and, and law and the framing of standards. How do you react to that in terms of the standards of practice that you talked about? Um. I would say in general, I'm, I'm in agreement with the comments that have been made by my colleagues. Um, and in addition, <clears throat> I guess to give a slightly more context, I think that National Center, we're not likely to change our name, but it is really a misnomer from early on in its existence. We have 50 fellows from around the world, um, from uh, I think six of the seven continents, um, <clears throat> and we've just continued to grow. Um, we've also collaborated with ICODER, which if you're not a member, I hope you'll consider being a member. It's the ODR membership organization of the field that was developed purposefully to um, work on ODR standards. And so um, I guess I'd say we've had a lot of fingerprints from a lot of different places on helping develop the, these standards, and we consider it honestly as a, as a living document. Our desire was to have um, while the UN continued importantly to discuss with nation states how to create ODR standards um, in UNCTRAL and um, regarding commerce in particular, um, and that journey was taking a long time because this process Six is years. yes, process is difficult, and the result for the time being is a one-page set of technical notes, which I'm not poo-pooing. It's valuable. It's important, but. Um, Meanwhile, courts and ADR practitioners have already been using technology, right? And so the question is, what can the field do, including users of the field, to help develop standards that we can commit to? Part of the reason also is so that we can provide input on what, leg what legislation should exist and what regulation should exist, but we can also start to self-regulate. Um, and so, I guess I would say we're part of a larger ecosystem where guardrails are really important. I think starting to issue best practices, which are more what the goals, what the aspirations are, and also documentation about how to get from the floor, which are standards, to best practices is really important. There's a lot of work. More hands on deck would be, would be welcome. The last thing, if I could somehow find a way to connect this to Christopher Columbus. I've got one thing sticking in my head that's somehow related. I'm thinking about the power of the doctrine of discovery, where hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years ago, legitimization for separating people and land and ecosystems from each other for the purpose of extraction and domination and benefits of others. That, that uh, message and those documents have impacted the whole world to the great detriment of the majority of the world and the benefit of others. And the pushback on the doctrine of discovery, I, I, I might be incorrect, but I believe the, the present pope announced an apology for the doctrine of discovery. And I'm struck by that because the conversation about AI for me feels connected to this. What happens when we separate humans from the ecosystem? What happens when we create AI that will create AI that gets separated from us and from each other? 
And dispute resolution in so many ways is about repairing our relationships, balancing our relationships, right? And so I want to bring that in the room because regulation and best practice and all these types of guardrails is about protecting what is human, right? And also our relationship with our, with our ecosystem. So I invite us to continue to have the really super practical discussion. How can I be the best practitioner or offer the best pl platform along with a 30,000 foot view, not only of where AI fits in, but also let's think historically, right? What, what can we learn about what hasn't worked and for whom? I think one of the, uh, the major issues in any creation of guardrails for AI is how do you make the creators of AI care? You know, it was the comment that I made earlier about the fact that when we decide that we can do something, we do it technologically. We don't think on the front end about whether we should be doing it or what the effects are going to be necessarily. And the comment that uh, uh, Zbigniew and I were talking about during the break is, uh, and uh, Jeremy, you brought this up as well, is, okay, you, you tell um, the creator of AI that they have to forecast the damage and the danger inherent in what they're creating. And if they, if they don't do that, then they're liable for the damage that they create. It's relatively impossible, I think, for a creator of an AI system to adequately figure out what the dangers are. Now, I'll give you just a, a very almost fanciful uh, example. Uh, on my Facebook page, I get pushed photographs of the young actress who was in the Harry Potter series. I'm, I'm blanking on her name at the moment. Uh, Emma Watson. Uh, with her head, uh, superimposed on people wearing very skimpy bikinis. And it's not her, it's her head, and it looks really good. I mean, it's, it's in the sense of it's impossible to tell really by, by looking at it that it's not real. Now, did the, the, the people who developed the ability to have AI create visual images think, oh, by the way, one of the damages that we're gonna cause is we're going to, to cause personal harm to an individual who is a public figure? Well, probably not, right? So, so there are some really interesting questions about what we should be looking for in terms of the guardrails and how we make the people who are creating AI care about making these guardrails and how we make them uh, responsible for it. Uh, so any questions from, from any of you guys or comments from any of you all? Yeah, Jeremy. A great conversation. Uh, and um, we could do a whole day on this or a whole week on it. Um, one small point, Leah, you talked about bias. Uh, I was honored to be part of a team at UCL of 17 people who wrote a paper which is on SSRN called Towards Algorithm Auditing. It is the most complex and difficult paper that I've ever been involved in. It's a computer science paper as well as a legal paper and an environmental paper. Uh, it's a 2021, if anybody wants to read it, I can uh, let you have the details of it. It sets out the difficulties of looking at not only bias, but other issues, performance, robustness, inter inter interpretability, explainability, privacy. And it goes into the phenomenally difficult technical issues that arise. So just to say, we've got to check the algorithm for bias before we launch it. You can't. Who checks it? And what are the criteria that you use to check for bias? And that's the concern that, that led me to write the paper that we did recently. So if anybody wants it, I can give you the reference afterwards. Again, it's just, if you put into SSRN, towards algorithm auditing, and it's by the computer science department at UCL and their friends. Yeah, absolutely. So just briefly, I, I really appreciate not only you sharing that um, specific citation and your experience, but I think this truly is a all hands on deck um, venture. Um, and it is gonna require us to work cross discipline 
And I am not personally arguing that we should not use any AI. It's just this needs to be an ongoing conversation. And I think we need more stakeholders who are impacted, um, more self-representing litigants who've experienced our processes at the table helping us define what user-friendly means. And I know some, some groups are doing that. I'm just giving, giving an, an, an example. And I think that the, <coughs> the enthusiasm and the fear need to be bridged. And so the important work that groups like yours did um, is important because we need to move from the theory to the practice. And that doesn't mean we stop our practice, right? But it, it, to me, it's entirely insufficient that facial recognition data after 50 years still regularly does not work well with people with dark skin complexion. It just means that hasn't mattered. We've been able to call it successful and not change that. And I think that the, the replication, uh, what does it want to say? Um, repeat bias that appears in mediation, and yet we call mediation successful. And for 50 years, we continue to have repeat player bias. So some of it is just owning the problems in our practice, especially when we add AI, and then saying we must be committed to addressing it. So thanks for your work on this. Well, just, just to follow up, what's the result of this is that everybody who puts an AI... We think everybody who puts an AI out on the market will have to have it audited. And the, the new profession that is going to grow, mm -hmm. instead of auditing your finance, so you go to KPMG or you go to Ernst Young, you will go to firms who audit your AI. And that's a growth, an explosive growth industry that is already started. But, uh, one quick comment. Um, the so what, uh, when, I, when I teach classes, uh, uh, we develop information, we develop ideas, we kick things around. But at the end of the day, what I ask the class at the end of, at the, end of the session is, so what? Now that we know that, what do we do? You know, is there anything that we should, any behavior we should engage in as a result of knowing the stuff that we now know? And then the so what for me for, for AI regulation or standards is that everybody who is involved, not just the people who develop the AI, but the people who are going to use the AI, the consumers who are going to say, oh yes, I will use that system, uh, have a whole lot of power. Uh, if if, for example, we were to say, and, and I'd like to get your guys' response to this as well, if we were to say, okay, we, we have now developed a set of standards that make sense for artificial intelligence programs. Here they are, there are nine of them. They, they come out of the uh, of ICODER in, uh, in the center. Um, and so, developer of, of an AI system, tell me how you deal with each one of these standards. What have you done to say that you're accessible, that you're safe? that you guard my, my information. And if they can't tell you that, I would hope that the market among all of us would say, you're not going to succeed. But if somebody can say, oh, this is what I do to, to uh, ensure accessibility, this is what I do to ensure privacy, and they can explain to you, you may not understand the technology behind it, and they may be lying to you <laughs> ultimately. But, but if they can explain it to you in a way that makes sense to you as a consumer, and you say, okay, I'll use that one, the market will help drive at least some good practices. Uh, so I'd, I'll throw that out there. What do you guys think about that? Well, but that I think the understanding of the purchaser is, you know, everyone's seen this, uh, was it uh, legal competency on the, on the, you know, I'm sorry, it has a technological competency of lawyers right now. Does everyone feel they work with a lawyer and every one of them is legally, co technologically competent? I mean, what, what, what is that standard, right? I mean, then you took it like, what, what, What's appropriate disclosure? Tesla Autopilot is not Autopilot. It is not Autopilot. It's not even a 2.5, which is a made up designation of what type of automation it is, right? So I, mean, I guess I wonder on the, on the bias piece, right? Um, and this is the part that I do support the UAI Act piece because it's, 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 a, it's a risk assessment. It doesn't say, hey, I'm gonna predict the future. It just does, it looks and says, what are my boundaries of my risk? And is this risk sufficient within this use of the tool? Right? And I think I, I would argue that a lot of those tools where we can't get facial recognition right, the harm comes when you apply them in legal technologies that are disproportionately uh, harassing or locking up the wrong people as a function of misidentification. So is, is, is the actual focus on our control, should it be on the tool itself or should it be on um, your ability to know whether or not that tool was going to meet your needs 
with it, with within that use case. That part, I, I, I personally don't. Apologies for sounding more definitive when these are questions. Apologies, you know, more than not. Which is, you know, wh wh where should we actually focus that uh, effort on those areas, right? Sh should we actually more focus on technological competence in a way that we can actually identify? Does a lawyer actually know what this tool does, right? Or is he just said, oh, well, this one's cheap, just like our businesses do in Iowa when they give away all of their all of their intellectual property, right? I don't know, is, is it a disclosure piece? Should we be madder about the fact that autopilot as a term is a fraud? It's what it is. They should be liable for the fraud, not for the fact that the actual tool that they built is fundamentally dangerous. I think that uh, there's a problem with, with uh, a lexicon here too, is uh, risk analysis, I think we all would agree that that's what you do. In Europe, they also use something called the precautionary principle, and I'm sure Jeremy is very aware of that. And that was the point I think that he was trying to make, is that unless you could prove the, the perspective, you were liable. And, and in other words, you know, it, 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 it's, it, it's, it's a major hindrance upon the growth of industries uh, when you've got a precautionary principle, and we can discuss this afterwards, perhaps at lunch, uh, in, in place. And so I think that you've got to be very careful when you start drawing lines about something that, again, we're perplexed and the people in the state capitals are completely clueless about this stuff. And I, I think that, that we need to, get, to be part of that discussion, uh, as, as Leah was talking about, uh, but we also make sure that, that we reach out to those who want to get to the same place. Mm -hmm. And if we leave it to the developers, what you're basically saying is, I am trusting the person who's doing this to make money to do it in a way that won't hurt me. Yeah. Um, and I don't feel comfortable with that personally. And, and I'm sort of an evangelist to my colleagues in the field of dispute resolution to get off your butts and be involved in the development of these, these uh, technologies that you're using, or at least try to understand them. The idea of competence has always been a fraught concept in dispute resolution. What makes a com competent mediator? Uh, you did a thousand mediations. Well, maybe you did a thousand bad ones. I don't know. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm a really good facilitative mediator, but my parties wanted me to be more uh, directive. So was I a bad mediator or did I just have a bad fit? Uh, the idea of what makes a competent mediator has always been tough, but part of competence for mediators in this environment, mm -hmm. and I believe firmly, is are you educating yourself enough about how the technology is being developed to be able to A, understand it on a basic level yourself, and B, be able to describe it to your customers, to your colleagues, to the people that you're working with, so that they understand enough to engage in self-determination, so that when they say, yes, I will join you in your mediation, they understand what they're joining. Uh, and so it's, it's an onus on us as third parties, not just on the people who are developing. It's an onus on us as third parties to educate ourselves enough to understand and to pass that understanding along to the people we're working with. End of sermon, sorry. Well, but yeah. can <laughs> I, can, to follow, can we follow the sermon real quick though, but isn't one of those failings on the part of us though because technology does nothing but amplify and accelerate human action. Are our processes that we accept sufficient enough to even understand what technology we should be applying to them? Right? I mean, is, is, is that part of our core failing that we've not actually, that, if I put a room of 85 mediators and say, how do you mediate? I'll get 486 answers that change every three minutes. Well, how do you build a technology to that? So, and how can we assess the technology without knowing what its fit is? Oh, sorry. Yes, sir. Yeah, so um, having spent 10 years of my career doing international standards, um, I can tell you this is not an easy process. And, <laughs> you know, creating a standard is different than adopting a standard, which is different than regulating the standard, right? You have to go, go all three. You can create all the standards you want, but if no one adopts them, it doesn't really matter, right? <coughs> If you look at what's going on in AI, you have a uh, number of IEEE standard bodies that are working on this stuff. You have ISO standards, you have stuff going on in the UN and European standards bodies are also working on this stuff. There's lots of bodies where you can play a role, okay, unless you want to get into the nitty gritty of the standard, is maybe influence which standard gets adopted for sitting, you know, trying to work out the nitty gritty of the stuff. And, and if anyone takes a look at the AI, uh, I forget which AI standard, which IEEE standard it is, 
you know, you can see people are talking about these things, but are not really being influenced other than primarily engineers who are working on this thing. Can, can I respond? Are you, are you suggesting that this body uh, become a standards body? I mean, and you would know what, the, what that in, entails. No. But any, any group can become a standard. Sure. <coughs> and, and of course, you know, you have de facto standards, market-based standards, there's different kind of categories of standards, right? And so if you wait for de facto standards, meaning somebody has made enough penetration in the market that you want to adopt their standard because enough people have already adopted it, market-based standards are more competitive and you have lots of players in it. The problem is getting multiple standards. <coughs> so multiple standards is equivalent to no standard. Right? But is that even, is that even a, a, an issue with ODR at this point? I don't think anybody's really trying to go that route yet, are they? It's, uh, well, yeah, but I mean, not so much have, ODR. Uh, actually, now that you mention it. They are, huh? <laughs> yeah, there, there are efforts for ODR standards. What, what can we say? Well. What we can say is that um, ISO has spent the last 11 months looking at the ICODE or NTCPR standards and that there will be a, a meeting next week to potentially reach a conclusion regarding that or at least the next step regarding that. But there's an ODR working group that's been working and ISO is, has 167 countries that are represented in the process. So, um, and uh, Colin and I and uh, Mike Dennis are functioning as representatives from the United States and there are other um, members of the ODR community from countries all over the world that participated in the working group. So I am in no position to represent the ISO, but I will just say that the central focus has been on these set of standards. Leah can't say this, but I have not been involved, and I can say it because they could sue me. I don't care. Um, <laughs> the hope is that at the end of the day that the ISO will adopt whole cloth the, uh, in the uh, center and ICODER standards, and then I should give credit to ICODER and the, and the center in the ISO standard that's issued. Now, as I said, I can say that because I, they can sue me and I won't care. She can't say that, but that's and my I, hope. And I didn't say that. That she didn't say that, but that is my hope, and this that is not, a, and that is not a hope that's built on idle speculation. It's a real hope that uh, very soon there will be an ISO standard that uh, reflects the work that we've done at the center in Icoda. Now, back to your point. Who cares, right? We yeah. should care, and that's. Uh, I'm sorry to, to prompt your, your response. No, but, but I think that's <laughs> It's also about how do you test that someone actually met the standards, right? So back to the auditing problem is once you've agreed on something that we might consider a standard because it's been adopted universally or enough of the markets adopted it, then we need to make sure that people adhere to the standard and we'll need a whole process for doing that as well. Right? Well, you either have a whole process for doing that or you insist as, a, as the marketplace, you insist that I will only buy your product if you ins if you express to me how you have addressed the standards that we've agreed are basic. If, if I refuse to buy your product unless you do that, that has some value in the market. Maybe not complete. Getting that collective behavior might be a little complicated. Um, Here we are, collected. Yes, well, yeah, right, <laughs> <so>. <laughs> Zinnick, I, you've been trying to yeah, say something. Uh, get a mic down to him, please. Thank you very much. So just just very quickly, and in fact, sort of following to, to what you mentioned, uh, I think that uh, ODR has a great uh, uh, advantage that, uh, f in comparison with other fields that this is really cross-domain. So it, uh, in every other field, uh, there are disputes, as uh, Itan always uh, is saying and uh, they, they will need ODR increasingly. So, uh, and, uh, so that's one, uh, one note. Second note uh, is that uh, at the moment, 
the AI is not only about AI regulation, it's also about new technology, uh, so that uh, it's about control of data, which means new technology. And uh, there are discussions, for example, you mentioned uh, Tim Berners-Lee, uh, he, a few years ago, he, he founded two new ventures, Interrupt and Solid, and uh, they are starting to, to, to get up, to, to basically uh, trying to, to, to develop new technology, basically. Uh, so perhaps it is also time to create, a discussion, to start a discussion with uh, initiatives like Interrupt or Solid. And uh, we are a community, so we have uh, representation by, by ICODR, by, by NCTDR, so uh, that, that's our advantage. So perhaps, uh, uh, and of course it will take time, but uh, uh, maybe in Prague f at the, the ODR forum we can invite somebody from INRAPT and SOLID and uh, uh, before that to, to start discussions. So in fact, uh, uh, and I would be very happy to uh, to, to be involved in that, maybe even others from the room who would be interested to be involved uh, may, may contact me. I will leave here some, some of my cards for those of you who uh, do not know my, uh, my contact details and uh, uh, we can coordinate uh, with, uh, with, with you, uh, uh, Leah, Dan and, and Itan. Uh, so, so what I am saying is that it's really, as you all were saying, it's now time to be active and uh, to, to, and we are community, so basically let's make use of it. Okay. Any other comments before I ask for final words from my colleagues? Sir, you get a mic for him, please. Um, yes, I'm not sure that this, this may be uh, whether this is helpful or not, but I, I thought I might mention just my, my sort of perspective on this as, as having had a career uh, developing AI applications. And um, so if, if uh, in, the, in the AI business, uh, and, and the, the thrust of it is that it's complicated to, um, um, uh, that the regulation of AI per se can be a little more complicated than it sounds. Um, so for example, the I believe that the dominant forms of artificial intelligence that we use in our everyday life are automated speech recognition in every single phone and Google Maps. So both of those things illustrate this typical AI trajectory that start out as research ideas that people have PhDs on and become prototypes and then become commodified, at which point nobody thinks about it particularly as being AI anymore, although it certainly is. In, in law, I think that the dominant machine learning application is learning to rank algorithms that are used in, in producing search results by uh, like LexisNexis Lex and Westlaw, yeah. something that people, I think it's fair to say that uh, hardly anybody is aware that there even is such a thing, and yet it is, it is there. Yeah, and, and you know, there's also e-discovery stuff. So if you think about uh, regulating applications like those, main applications that get really used a lot, it's, it's a little mind-boggling to, you know, learning to rank algorithms, sure, it could be biased in, in various ways, and you can evaluate it, but uh, it's, it's a little bit, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's complicated. Or here's another example in f for pro se litigants, the dominant form of AI, although it's pretty simple-minded, is legal uh, systems for helping them fill out forms. Okay, and, and I myself and others have argued that those things really need to have, have validation and verification uh, standards, for sure. They don't have it. On the other hand, there's so scarce resources for creating them at all that it's not realistic to think that, you know, we'll use this, but only if you, you know, demonstrate that it conforms to some specifications. That, that's, that's a better world. Um, so, uh, so it's, it's, it's tricky, and, and my, I, I guess my own, once again, just from my own perspective, I tend to think that the validation really applies not to al algorithms, but to systems. Um, certainly when you evaluate something like a system that's deployed to somebody, you can, you, can, you can evaluate the individual algorithms, 
using, as I mentioned before, these techniques like cross-validation, you can say, well, it's 70% accurate. But really what you want to know is, is the system as a, as a whole, is it being destructive or does it, you know, have some bad behavior? Um, and, and it seems to me like, well, to answer that question, you need to know what it's trying to do. Um, and it isn't, and, 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 and actually the very most destructive systems that we have are like social media. As I don't know if that's AI or not, but, um, and it's also something that's hard to regulate. So anyway, so I, I don't know if these observations are, are helpful at all, but it's like, well, AI follows this arc typically, and that makes it hard to understand exactly how to, I mean, this has already been kind of adverted to, how you, how you evaluate these standards, which of course, the, you know, the, the, the standards that you've been talking about, Leah, that, that you introduced, of course, yes, every system should be conformed to those. But anyway, my, I guess my feeling is maybe it's sort of a system level rather than an algorithm level thing. And maybe just because of my line of work, I think of AI as being this, this highly, uh, you know, algorithmic thing rather than the overall system, which is, I think, what we really care about. Yeah. Well, I, I think you use the word complicated. I think that's, you, you underline that twice. And, and that's, that's where we are, it's complicated. I would, however, before I turn it over to my colleagues, I would say that I do see a difference in, for example, a voice recognition program, which you know I can use, I can look at it, and I can curse it when it gets my, my voice recognition wrong and says something I don't want to say. Um, but that's, that's a different animal, in my mind anyway, and I'm not a technologist, to adopting a piece of AI technology that is going to come between me and the people I'm working with in a mediation that's going to suggest outcomes, that's going to suggest language that I use to talk to them. That seems to me to be on a different level. And I agree with you, it's complicated to regulate that. But if there are at least some principles that we ask people to deal with and have in mind when they're creating the technology, at least that gets us somewhere. Yeah, that's best, uh, best practices. Yeah. So uh, l last words, go down there and start this way. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I guess, uh, oh. I do, I do think that it should really probably be focused on, you know, what is, the, what is the actual process you're looking to do in the end of the day, right? I think that when you're looking at how do we actually regulate these the way we probably are looking at other places and probably is a reasonable way to move forward to get around some of the complexities we're identifying is it's going to have to be case by case and use by use and expectation by expectation normed down to something that is using learning-based algorithms, right? I mean, that's... That's something we'll carry across all of these. Uh, and I, I do think that if we are taking a performance-based approach to this versus a traditional regulatory approach, I think there's probably a whole lot more avenues to, to be doing something meaningful. And again, most of those performance-based approaches are dependent on standards that everyone actually has agreed to. They're developed by practitioners as opposed to doing it on your own and out, to, out in the middle of nowhere by yourself. Scott? I think that um, the whole idea of, of standards um, is sometimes misconstrued because it, 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 it works with regulation. They, you need them both. It, it, it's, uh, they're, you know, they're, they're, they're two sets of, 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 of skill sets that have to be part of, of the solution. And so I, I don't want to get across that, that, uh, that laws aren't, aren't necessary. I think, but I think they're especially necessary for, for ratifying where the culture, where the technology is already going. I think you need to know enough before you can write the law uh, and not overwrite the law, and that requires time to go by. So I'm really hoping that we'll see, you know, I think we're already seeing it in Europe, and I, I think, uh, uh, and in China, and, and I, I think what, what, what England is doing, or the UK is doing, is just about the right, the right spot, well, but that's, that's a different, different discussion. But I, I think that, that there's an opportunity now, I think, for those in this room. I mean, this would be such a great resource for AI scraping. And they would love to have everybody in this room, <laughs> believe me. But, but the whole idea is that we have, you know, um, gravitas and authority that others do not have in this, in this field. And I think that there is a moment here where that can be leveraged. And I hope that that'll, that'll be the season. So, we well have a community doing this work. Yeah. Last word, Leah. So we're building on that. I guess I would say we all have a part to play. That's my opinion. And you know where your sphere of influence is. 
um, if membership organizations have these conversations and decide whether these are the right standards for them or whether they want to build best practices that come from their value set. I just think we all have a role to play. The other thing is I was thinking about, um, we so often think about um, making something user friendly or relevant to the user. And I wonder if our standard was um, the most vulnerable, the least connected, instead of the average user. Um, I think that it would capture a whole lot of what we're, what we all are committed to. Um, and so I, I encourage, I wanna use one of the fel our fellows, um, Vicki Rogers' words to close and say, say um, we don't want our software developers to be the gatekeepers for access to justice, but I would say we do want them to partner with us to help increase access to justice. Fair enough. Thank you all for your time. You're released for lunch. Oh. <laughs> <laughs>